All right, welcome everybody to another live Perceptive podcast here on Twitch, and for those of you watching this recorded on YouTube, I am still Josh Beiser, and I can hear my voice in the background. There we go, that's better. And we have a great live discussion for you today. I'm going to be talking with a returning guest who just finished releasing his first major game that he worked on, that's Tormentor X Punisher. So, please welcome to the stream tonight, Jonas Turner. And before you say anything, let me just raise the sound up. There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Hey, Jonas, it's great to have you on today. How are you doing? Thanks. Yeah, it's great to be back. Um, Doing good, a bit hectic (laughs) (laughs) time-wise. So much to do. Like like you said, mentioned, uh, we released Tormentor X Punisher, and I'm working on a bunch of games already. (laughs) <laughs> on top of that. <laughs> cool. And for those of you who are new or tuning in, Jonas and I spoke on a podcast a few months ago. I think, was it around like April or March that we last spoke? Or was it a little bit before that? I think it was like March or maybe even before that. I can't, I can't remember. Again, I have no concept of time anymore with doing everything yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, it's already summer. That surprises me. <laughs> I know, it doesn't feel like it's been somewhere, and hi uh, Jay Wolf, and hi El Gordo, thanks for tuning in live. But yeah, it's been a very hectic couple of months. As we were recording this today, my internet's been going on and off, I have Comcast coming out tomorrow to replace the modem, so I'm hoping we stay online, but it seems like everything has to happen all at once around here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And for those of you watching this live, depending upon how things go, I may or may not have a little uh, weekly recap show later this evening. So here's hoping we can stay online for it. But um, for right now, Jonas, for people watching this, either live recorded who may not have listened to our podcast, could you talk a little bit about your background when it comes to the video game industry? Sure thing. So yeah, I'm normally known as a sound designer, as voice actor. Uh, I worked on a bunch of games such as Badland 1 and 2, Nuclear Throne, Downwell, Bro Force, Environment 2 Station Alpha, Bleed 2, and so on and so on and so on. I've worked on a bunch of games as a sound designer. And right now, um, a year ago, I started working on my own game called Tormentor X Punisher commercially. And we just released it. So that's a quick recap of myself. <laughs> I know when we spoke about when we spoke last time we talked about uh Bro Force. Like it would be awesome like to have that guy I think we were saying like the uh announcer do like the announcements for Game Wisdom. That would just be like the <laughs> that would be perfect. It'll wake everybody up or we'll have like him like randomly say things throughout the cast just like as a way to keep people awake and alert. <laughs> yeah, it's kinda of funny. Like Bro Force like we discussed last time was kind of a funny thing. Was- a bunch of South African uh, fellows and a Finnish guy <laughs> making the most American game out there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, you never know sometimes where everyone comes from when it makes video games like this. Um, so, I guess with Tormentor X Punisher, how long was it in development for? Um, so, it's kind of a funny timeline. Um, I made the original prototype myself. Uh, I started the prototype back in like the end of 2014, start of 2015, and it's just something I wanted to, I, I, I kind of wanted to make a game for the controller. I had never made my own game for a controller before, mm-hmm. so I tried to kind of learn how controllers work, and, and it's just a small prototype thing, and then I got my friend Tuk to do the graphics on top, and then we kind of had this small prototype like at the beginning of 2015 ready, and I showed that prototype to a bunch of friends at GDC and other game events, and suddenly kind of gained traction. And then I didn't really think much of it, but then um, after some time, like in 2016, kind of picked up even more um, speed, and suddenly I re- like suddenly I had a publisher for the game and funders as publishers. So we started working on it commercially since July 2016. Cool. Yeah, and I think like with Tormentor X Punisher, we talked about this on the podcast last time, but you really uh, went into this, I guess, 
designed for a very quick engagement. Like when you originally came with the design for Tormentor, you weren't thinking this was going to be like a eight to ten hour action game. You were like from the start wanting this to be more about very quick engagements of play. Yes, that's the kind of games that I like to play the most. Mm -hmm. Like I personally, um, I mean, I understand the appeal of games that take like mm -hmm. hundred hours or. <laughs> 500 hours to play, but to me, I personally like to just pick up a game, play it in an evening, or play it through in an evening, and be like, oh, that was a fun game, and then maybe picking it up again. Or like small arcade games like Luftrausers or Geometry Wars and stuff like that. Just like those games that just have like replayability by themselves, by kind of forcing you to be better mm -hmm. to gain more replayability, if that makes sense. And yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's always tricky when you're trying to come up with the length of certain games. Like, as a quick example, I'm playing, at the moment, two very different shmup-style games. Drifting mm. Lands and Monolith. One's a shmup-slash-ARPG, the other one's a shmup-slash-roguelike. Mm. And they're both, like, pretty much completely different ends of the spectrum in terms of game length. Monolith is designed like very similar to The Binding of Isaac, where a solid quote-unquote run takes maybe 30, 35 minutes once you know what you're doing, and then you can replay the game as many times as you want. While Drifting Lands is going for this massive um, uh, title where there's like, I think, like 100 different levels, and I'm only like, I'm like 7, 8 hours in, I barely scratched the surface. And mm. There's always that risk, I think, of basically extending things out too long and the gameplay just doesn't work. Or it can't sustain itself over, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours. Mm -hmm. And it's always tricky when you're trying to get that balance going. Like, for instance, like with The Buying of Isaac, at this point, I think I must have over, like, 100 to 200 hours spent playing that game, but in, like, 30, 40 minute chunks each time. Whereas, like, it was something like Drifting Lands, I can start to feel myself getting a little bit tired of the game because the gameplay isn't really changing over the last five, six hours I've spent playing it. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those games... I mean, I don't know that much about Drifting Lands, but... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I just, I just heard of it, I think, yesterday. <laughs> but, I like, the Monolith game, that looks pretty sweet. Like, yeah. I can't wait to pick that one up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, for those of you watching this live right now, I posted a video about it today, and if the internet stays up, tomorrow I'll post my grand victory of the game, because I've been playing the preview build that they sent to me like a week ago, so I've had a little bit of a chance to get good at the game. So I'm, I think I've just about finished it, but yeah, I'm really enjoying it. And it's always interesting about that kind of quick engagement, but you can just keep replaying the game. Something like Spelunky or The Buying of Isaac, and especially something like Tormentor X Punisher. I mm. guess uh, my question for you is, when it comes to a like, game like Tormentor X Punisher, it reminds me a lot of Devil Daggers, and how it's supposed to be, again, something that you can either play for like 5-10 seconds if you're bad, but once you start learning it, it gets to about like 10 minutes, 15 minutes plus. I guess, how did you uh, settle on the balance of, I guess the best way of saying it would be, like, what would be considered, like, the average length that someone is playing a round of Tormentor X Punisher for? Yeah, so that's kind of an interesting, interesting topic. Um, like, balancing the game. Um, so my intended length of play would be, like, if you're decent at the game, like, I don't know, like, at first, well, actually, I'll start from the beginning. Like, at first, when you start playing the game, you'll survive for, like, half a minute <laughs> or a minute. <laughs> I think that's what I did. It was, like, 20, 30 seconds the first time playing. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, kind of, then, like, when you die at the first time, you're like, ah, oh, what killed me? And then the game teaches you how to play the game, and you're like, oh, okay, I can reload like that. I can do this and this. And then... You survive for a minute, because you realize, oh, those were shielders, they dash at me. Oh, okay, now I understand, I can do this and this. And then you kind of progress through the few, but like varied enemy types, and you're like starting to understand and grasp their mechanics. This is kind of something that I loved about Spelunky, where mm -hmm. you're kind of always kind of 
you have to always be prepared for stuff and like learn new stuff. And same with like Dark Souls or Bloodborne and stuff like that, where you just you know, you have to observe the enemies to understand your mistakes. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, we like when you survive around a minute, that's when the first boss usually uh, like spawns. And then you're like, oh wow, there are bosses. And with the bosses, they're like mini action puzzles. So you have to cause, have to like because everything is one hit death. So you have to like figure out how to beat the boss, and that might take you know three seconds before you die the first time meeting <laughs> the first boss, and then you just kind of learn the bosses and stuff like that. So it's kind of a natural progression, and the way we balance it out is just you know we kind of give the player indications of what always happened. So they kind of always know why they died, or like preferably they preferably they uh, like learn why they died. And they kind of always learn to kind of take that extra step forwards. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how we designed the whole thing. And damn, I had like a better four by <laughs> eluded in my mind, it's too late. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's always straight when you're doing these live things, especially, I think, is either your cast or, no, it was with the Battle Brothers developer that I had this really great, like, question, and then I lost it. And then, mm -hmm. like, it was, like, two, three hours later, it, like, popped into my head. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But, yeah, yeah, like, balancing was a huge, huge thing to us. And, like, the game length. So when you start out, it's going to be, like, half a minute. Then you get a bit better, it's going to be 45 seconds. Then it's, like, a minute, minute, 30 seconds, and then you get up to like two minutes, and then like the ideal play time is, would be like three minutes, mm -hmm. three to five minutes, and like when the game becomes like five minutes long, you know that you have probably killed all of the bosses and you are entering the second loop of the game. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like I, we wanted to keep the game really small, that's just like my core idea of the game. It's small, fast, and it's super quick to back get back into. Mm -hmm. And for those of you watching this right now, of course, it is a, a G-rated game, right? This is family-friendly, you know, fun for all ages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this game, like, I mean, it's it's one of these weird decisions where I was like, do I want to make the game, like, proper stupid, or do I want to keep it, like, you know, family-friendly? And I decided to go, like, all-out dumb, swearing and major stuff, because, I don't know. I feel like we need a bit of that in this day and time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The um, the intro cuts, you know, that was definitely a very interesting thing there. <laughs> I, how did you uh, come up with the cutscene for Tormentor? I'm so, so happy that we got to make that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I always had this idea of making some kind of an animation or something. And then I, like, I did a storyboard for it and everything, and then luckily our like promotional artist who does all of our like cover images and stuff um John Bermilly um he is actually an animator as well mm -hmm. draws animations uh he's done some stuff for Rick and Morty and so on and so on and his friend who he brought along to animate the thing David Gemmill uh mm -hmm. he works on Teen Titans and stuff like that oh. so they're like Cartoon Network <laughs> just like Adult Swim dudes and nice. yeah I just jammed with them and then we came up with that animation <laughs> <laughs> cool who uh, voice um, does the main character have a name in Torment or is she just like a um, screaming <laughs> violent woman <laughs> okay so her name she actually has a name and it's kind of a funny story behind her name so uh, my friend Rami Ismail who's the other half of Lambeer, who mm -hmm. made Nuclear Throne, Super Crate Box, and so on and so on. Um, he never really, he never really understood Tormentor Punisher's name. He always misheard it or re misremembered it. And we were at PAX West, I think, and he was like, "Oh, go and check out Jonas's game. It's Terminator something." <laughs> and I was like, "Terminator something." I was like, Gee, "That's a great name for a main character." <laughs> so. She's named Terminator something. <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course, for people watching this, what's the name of the planet that this game takes place on, too? <laughs> so, yeah, um, I've always imagined, like, 
like if planets were named like really dumbly and this was like the ultimate dumb name and I was like yeah I'm keeping this so the planet which all of this happens in happens in is called planet fuck you mm. <laughs> what's really great though is uh, for those of you watching this I turned on the um <laughs> the mod options on Twitch just so that to keep people from being too um, offensive and now we have <laughs> we have to describe the name of the planet so it's perfect <laughs> that we have to turn it off just so people can see the name of the planet <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh we're going to have trouble with that <laughs> that's alright uh, I like that for a game like Tormentor Explanation <laughs> again this is not a game for the um as we said, this is not a game for the eight and younger crowd. Despite oh, no. having uh, someone from Teen Titans animating it. Now, this is not... <laughs> we're not playing this on after Teen Titans. Maybe after Rick and Morty. I think this will probably yeah. be closer to Rick and Morty than Teen Titans. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm the kind of person who's like... I mean, political correctness, it's... Mm. I mean, it has its place, but... I'm the kind of person who likes to kind of push boundaries a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Torment Exposure certainly does, that, especially with that intro scene. Um, who was the voice actress who played uh, Terminator or something? <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, my good friend Isa And. Uh, she also did the voices for um, for Ro uh, Rebel in Nuclear Throne, and she did the female bros in Bro Force and the main character from Bleed 2. Mm. And actually, a funny thing is that when I made the original Jam version, like my own version of the game, uh, the game also acted as a vocal tryout for Isa, because I was like wondering if she would be a good fit for like working with me on like voice acting stuff. Because like I, I had never heard her voice act before, and I was like, well, let's try this out. And she totally nailed it. It's perfect for the character. And I was like, I was like, man, she can really scream and shout. And like, she can be like, she can kind of pull out the ugly voice and be in the character. And I was like, not everyone can do that. I was like, <laughs> she's definitely hired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, one question from Chad. Is there any penis in this game? Considering how mature this is. Thank you, XP, for asking that. <laughs> No, actually. Oh, I don't think good. so. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least we don't have to worry about that. Uh, uh, we were talking about this last week. I was playing this relaxing game called Oath Match, and for some reason YouTube flagged it for <laughs> copyright content or for being too mature. I'm like, what did you guys say in chat? So now I'm making fun <laughs> of them. Whenever they talk about anything that's going to get me banned. So we'll see oh, what no. happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, man. But yeah, um, the uh, our friend Terminator or something that was certainly a uh, shock when I heard that voice. Like, oh, <laughs> again, I was like, "This intro cutscene that looks very simple," and all of a sudden, all the craziness uh, broke through there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I kind of I, I love adult swim shows, and I love stuff like you know, uh, Cargo of Barbaria, oh, yes. Prison Pit, uh, Super Jail. Oh, thank King you for Starting. mentioning uh, Super Jail. Yeah, I, I enjoy Pickles. that show. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just that's that's like I just those animations I like honestly love and adore. I just that style where like anything can happen. It, like the whole show can change in like a nanosecond. I I don't know. Just I like that feeling of never being sure what's up. <laughs> um, hi Pine. Yeah, sorry about the different times. This is whenever we do live uh, developer cast like this, we have to. Uh, try matchings with the schedule. I think. What time is it where you're at, Jonas, right now? Uh, it's around twenty past ten. In yeah. So we, PM. Yeah. So he is seven hours ahead of me. Yeah. Normally, when we do our live streams, for those of you watching this, it's usually around like um, ten o'clock, nine, ten o'clock EST time. But again, whenever we have a special guest on, we do have to. We do usually end things early because. Not everyone can be streaming and talking at 10 o'clock uh, EST, but um, that don't worry. If you do miss anything, especially these live interviews, they will be archived on YouTube, and then you can watch it whenever you want. But uh, getting back to it, yeah, I really enjoyed Super Jail. You mentioned uh, King Star King, right? Because that was also remind me of Tormentor's style. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's just one of those weird series that mm -hmm. kind of does what they want to do. And I kind of like that. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's nice to see things that kind of break the mold. Oh, yes. For the, anyone who saw King Star King, that was certainly one of those what the hell am I watching kind of shows. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. Talking about that, like the other day I was watching uh, some streamer play, actually Kakujo, playing uh, Tormentor X Punisher on his stream, and someone mentioned me, oh, this game reminds me of uh, Epic Spell Wars of the Battle Wizards, Jewel at Mount Skull's Fire, and I was like, what is that? That name is awesome. And then I googled it, and it's this card game that has amazing graphic I mean like amazing drawings on it mm -hmm. and the game itself is pretty sweet and I order it like immediately and it arrived to me today and I'm actually looking at the box as we are cool. speaking <laughs> and really before I forget uh, Crowbar High Five asks what is the story behind the second player character in co-op oh hi Rika uh, what was the question again what was the <laughs> story behind the second playable character that's in the co-op version Oh, 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 I'm not gonna tell about this story just yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we might be doing something cool, maybe. Like, hopefully. If the game does well enough, we are gonna do something cool <laughs> with that character. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And talking about that animation, like, I guess to wrap up or go a little bit more in detail, that's one of the things I really like about, like, that kind of stuff, like, Super Jail and King Star King, is that, like, hand drawing like, look to it. And mm -hmm. that's always been, like, one of the things I love when I see games go for that kind of style, whether it's in full game or, like, cutscenes and such. Like, uh, for those of you who don't know, I love to watch a lot, like, the, like, I've got like all like the Looney Tunes on a DVD so I always love like that hand drawn look you have for characters mm, same here like to me like this this is gonna be an odd topic but like, when people ask me like oh do you watch anime and I'm like yes and no <laughs> to me I like it's gonna sound really elitist of me I don't <laughs> really mean it like that but I guess it is uh, <laughs> is that to me like I'm I find the it's kind of really hard to me to enjoy cartoons that are like completely like computerized if that makes sense even it's like in anime when it's like this weird they look too polished to me I like when there's a bit of grit to it mm -hmm. like Cowboy Bebop or Trigun and stuff like that that kind of anime is just like that I like that stuff or like mm -hmm. Akira and stuff like yeah. that but when it's like the modern stuff it's not not my jam, really. Yeah, it's the same thing for me with a lot of, like, modern, like, um, animation or modern cartoons over here mm. as well. Especially, like, the very CGI look that we see with a lot of kid shows these days. Oh, yeah. That everything looks too smooth. Like, everyone has, like, one thing that always annoys me is, like, everyone has, like, the same facial structure. Like, they all look like, <laughs> like uh, the same kind of dolls kind of thing. That's always uh, bothered me, like, about, like, modern animations. Yeah, it's same here. Like that's that's not for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it looks like we have some fans of Trigun and Cowboy Bebop in the chat. And, oh yeah, love oh, nice. both of them. Love Cowboy Bebop. They announced that they're going forward with a live action Cowboy Bebop that my mind is still kind of reeling from when I heard that announcement. Yeah, it's kind of scary. I hope they have like. Adam Slan Sandler and stuff like that it's just <laughs> ruining it <laughs> <laughs> no I hope it's going to be good but you know I uh, usually like, I, I, this, oh man I'm going to sound like such a bummer but it's like video game adapted like uh, movie adaptations of like video games mm -hmm. and like real life acted stuff of like anime and cartoons and stuff I, I mean they're really really good mm -hmm. I, it, like so, so they never really work like Resident Evil movies mm, it's like they don't really work in movie form or like real real life form mm -hmm. like with anime like I've never seen like an anime like Ghost in a Cell movie it's mm -hmm. not like this series at all <laughs> <laughs> oh, one well. second I want to make our chat window try to make it just a little bit bigger for folks can see hopefully that will work at least a little bit better I can I'm kind of like trying to get things working there, but yeah, especially like I heard that they're going to be doing a, a live adaptation of Death Note, which I'm not sure how that is going to turn out. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, before we... I forget. Uh, v the Ghost asks, was there any particular films or comics that you drew inspiration from for Tormentor X Punisher? Oh, definitely. Like I mentioned earlier, like Prison Pit, uh, Super Jail, mm -hmm. Corgo of Barbaria, and King Star King, like Mr. Pickles. Mm -hmm. All these, like cartoons, I mean, like car uh, comics and um, cartoons, uh, they're, they're my biggest inspiration for Tormentor X Punisher, alongside Geometry Wars, and a Finnish game series called Tapan Kaikki. Mm -hmm. Those were like my ultimate like inspirations. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, we, people are talking about anime and such in the chat, but yeah, like I said earlier, like that kind of hand-drawn look always is appealing to me. And again, if we wanted to, we could probably spend the next hour, hour and a half talking about <laughs> animation. Oh, easily, yeah. <laughs> For anyone uh, watching this as well, uh, one of the podcasts I would love to do would be to talk about, like, talk to animators or people who've been working on animated series today. Um, I was trying to branch out of that a few years ago, but I could never find a guest. But if anyone would like to come on for that, um, you know, hit me up with an email. And I would love to talk to you, especially also with voice acting. I would love to talk to, like, especially with the recent discussions about, I think we may have brought this up when we talked about the whole voice actor strike mm -hmm. and what that meant for video games. Because I would love to talk to a few professional voice actors about their roles as well. Hmm. Yeah, is it still going? I think it is at the moment, but there hasn't been any, like, uh, major news about it, at least on like Gamma Sutra. Hmm. Wow. But wow, that's a long strike. I know. <laughs> but getting back to the topic, wait, let's see. All right, a few questions from Chad V. The Ghost: Was the game made mostly to be in your face for the sake of it, or do you feel like it fits in comfortably with the game? And do you think more games should be as visceral, obscene, and in-your-face as Tormentor X Punisher? Ooh, um, great question. So, it, it... I mean, it was more of an artistic thing to be in-your-face, but it also works game-wise. I think it kind of adds to the kind of thrill and panic of the game, where you're like, oh no, that's, everything's happening, and it has to be in-your-face to be, like, like, maximum levels of, like, <laughs> Intense, like the intensity. I wanted to be like as high as, like almost possible. I, mean, I don't know. It's, I like it. It's like it's like the shows that I like. They're really in your face and weird. Um, but 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 what was the other thing? Now? Um, do uh, you think games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> oddly enough, no. Like, I like when games do that, but they have to do it right to kind of work because I've played some games that have been like in your face but in a really kind of like quotation mark like dude kind of a way mm -hmm. and I that does not really work for me like it has to be kind of properly designed over a thing but like I guess like Dark Souls is actually surprisingly in your face all the time like, it kind of rubs it in as well. It's like, oh, you died. Like, we don't address that you died. Dark Souls does with huge capital letters, and that <laughs> screen takes, like, half a minute. Like, if something's in your face, it's that. And it fits that game perfectly. But, I don't know. I like games with, like, varied styles. Mm -hmm. Like, it can, they can be serene, nice. It depends on the mood and kind of what I want to achieve. Like, oddly enough, when I play... Well, when I used to play like games like World of Warcraft, I really liked the serene moments more than the hectic moments. Where I would go to an area and like, like adore like the like a forest. I would be like, oh, how this forest feels vast. Or like in the new Zelda game, mm -hmm. I went to a forest and I was just like, oh, wow, this forest feels cool. Yeah, matching yeah. Uh, the aesthetics to the gameplay is definitely a major part. It's one of those things that I think really elevates a good game to an amazing one. Like you mm. said, with like Breath of the Wild, um, even with something like um, Wind Waker would be another really good example that, while mm. it doesn't... I know a lot of people, at least at the time, complained that it was looking too kitty, but when you look at that on HD, it's like, oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. 
Um, another question before it gets too far away. Ankh P asks, what is the highest score that the development team match should get in Tormentor? Oh, I think my highest score has been like 300 and something <laughs> thousand. How long is, have you lasted for? Um, without killing any enemies, I've lasted around like two minutes. <laughs> but like in general, I don't, I don't, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Probably four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but think... like today, actually, I have to quickly jump in. Like I got like three hundred thousand points the day. Uh, one of our community players called Noise. I uh, got one million and three hundred. Yeah, I points. saw that pose on Twitter about it too. Oh. <laughs> wow, it's just wow. Mm -hmm. I think right now, I think I'm sitting at about three and a half minutes as my best run so far. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, and like with a game like this, especially built around like that kind of quick engagement. One of the challenges of games like this, especially something like the Buying of Isaac and Monolith, of course, is trying to keep each run different. Because if the player is mm. just doing the same exact thing, they're going to get bored out of their minds after run, you know, 50, much less run 25. I yep. guess, for people watching this who haven't played Tormentor yet, how have you guys, I guess, kept the game replayable on multiple runs? Like, if you can talk a little bit about, like, the bosses and how, what they do to the game. So yeah, um, so first off, we had this upgrade system in the game where depending on which tricks you pull with your shotgun, you can gain points towards different upgrades that you will eventually learn if you repeat that trick uh, like often enough in successful attempts. And when you like pull, let's say, a up upgrade called Hot Stuff, where you shoot the shotgun through fire to kill an enemy, and after you gain Hot Stuff, your shotgun also shoots fire. Mm -hmm. And all the upgrades stack on top of each other. So, you know, you can, in the start of the run, you can kind of decide on which build you want to build this time. Mm -hmm. Like, what upgrades do you want to get in the beginning? And that kind of adds. And also, because it's a high score chaser game, like, you chase for the high score. Mm -hmm. Depending on which upgrades you do, they kind of score you differently. And, like, what kind of combos, how do you kill enemies, all of this um, affects your scores. And then, eventually, when a boss does spawn, we have a pool of seven bosses that get... I think it's seven. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think we have seven bosses. Um, it's like a pool of seven bosses, and one of those will randomly spawn, spawn uh, in the game. So you never know which boss you will be facing first. And depending on the order of bosses, the level changes accordingly. Meaning that you have always, like, at least... Like, in minimal, you have seven different outcomes to your run. Which is kind of cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question from chat. V the Ghost asks, how many secret modes do you have in Tormentor? <laughs> <laughs> we do. That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I guess um, two questions, or actually I have a few questions regarding the skill system for you, Jonas. Uh, the first one is... Are the skills, like, is there anywhere in-game that shows you, like, the prerequisites for the skills, or do you just have to experiment, see that I shoot an enemy, and then I get, like, the little pop-up on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is what I loved about games like Spelunky, or the like, where, or in Nuclear Throne, what we did, and Dongle and stuff, where you have a bunch of, kind of, secrets, or not even secrets, just, like, different mechanics in the game that you have to figure out yourself. Like, for instance, in Spelunky, I just loved the fact... When I started playing the game, and I would see, like, a arrow trap, and it would shoot at me, and I would get hit. I would be like, oh, man, this is impossible. Like, how can I... Like, they will always hit me. What can I do? And then I realized, oh, I can pick up a rock. I was like, wait, if I drop this rock in front of the arrow trap, will it trigger the arrow trap? And it did. And I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Like, suddenly learning these mechanics without them being told to me. Mm -hmm. That was just... To me, that was mind blowing. I was like, "Oh, I love this!" And, and 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 that's kind of what we want to do with Tormentor, where you do things and you like experiment and you see if it gives you something, like if there's like a response from the game. And that's what I like. I love when games talk to you back, like you have a conversation with the game. I just that's something that I enjoy, and that's what we did a bunch in Tormentor. 
Like, there are things, there are interactions that some people haven't even realized yet. And even, like, core players haven't realized yet, which to me is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I just love that. And one thing, like, um, we're about to patch something in the game where we realize that people are doing something and we realize that the game doesn't have a vocabulary to address that. And now we <laughs> added that in the game. Well, not yet, but we are about to add that in the game. And I just can't wait to see people's reactions. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and it, when I first started playing, I was like, wait, I see these like bonuses like Waller pop up, a long distance, like, what could that mean? And then once I got the Waller, I saw how it increased the a uh, wall shot at this. And I was like, oh, now, that was very interesting. In terms of, as you said, it's essentially a perk system, but it's one you have to actively work for to yeah. go after in Tormentor. Yeah, exactly. And that's like one of my like biggest design um, choices in the game, or like design like ambitions in the game was that you don't need to go through menus in the game. Because in games, I and this is kind of a bummer because like most games do this these days. I hate, I actually actually like hate going through inventory in games. Like inventory systems, I just I. I, it takes away from the I, I hate things that take you away from the game from the actual action when you have to go through like backpacks and read in item information or if you have to like uh, craft items or something I just to me that is not fun like to me that's t like time away from the actual game itself mm -hmm. like from the action itself and in Tormentor I wanted to make a system where you don't have to stop the game. Like, the game doesn't let you stop, and the game will not, they, you know, it will never stop, and you can't really stop the game un unless you exit the game. <laughs> yeah. And I like that. Yeah, I just did a, for those of you watching this live, I just posted a vlog about UI design, and one of the things that drives me nuts is when, as you said, you have to constantly flip between two or more screens to do something. Whether it's, you know, going through your inventory, having to just repeatedly craft things, or even just having to, like, figure out how these items work. Like, one of the things I love what they did with Diablo 3 was they eventually just gave you the three stats, and you just see the mm. green numbers that tell you, okay, this is better, red means it's bad. So I only have yeah. to, like, read the description, I just know, okay, this is going to give me 20% more attack. Good, put it on, let's get back to the killing. Exactly. Yeah, that that's kind the best of... thing to happen to Diablo <laughs> since Diablo 2. <II. laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, like I was just playing a game called uh, Bounty Train. We did this last week on stream, and it requires you constantly flip through um, a resource screen to see how much things are how much things are worth before you can actually buy them and sell them somewhere else. And that kind of like thing it just drives me crazy because obviously it's only a few seconds each time, but it's a few seconds that gets repeated, you know, repeat mm. so many times that it just drives me crazy. And then, as yeah. you said, it just adds up over an hour, five hours, ten hours, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another great point that I kind of want to address with Tormentor. Um, so, I personally hate loading screens, and I mm -hmm. guess a lot of people <laughs> do. Uh, <laughs> and, like, my one of my core ideas with Tormentor was that there is essentially no loading screens. Like, everything happens immediately, unless it's mm -hmm. bound to like internet connection or stuff like that, then we can't do anything about it. But, um, but like, when you restart the game, it restarts immediately. Yeah. And, like, I was playing Final Fantasy VII again one day, and, like, I remember playing as a kid, I loved the game as a kid, I played it through a million times and all the secrets and stuff, and I tried to play it again, and, each time you would enter a battle, mon like a, like into the battle, mm -hmm. you would have this montage that takes literally a minute every time. And at some areas you might have like 250 enemy interactions. And it has 250 minutes of no gameplay. Mm -hmm. That's pretty crazy if you think about it. <laughs> I know. And uh, before we get back to the skills, Jay Wolf asks, what's the story behind uh, Terminator something? <laughs> I guess oh, uh, they um, want to know what, 
I guess is that did you miss the part about we talk about how the name came about, or do you want like an actual uh, plot about what Terminator something is? <laughs> so about plot, mm -hmm. um, intro cinematic tells it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we need to know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like. We've been actually talking about it. It'd be cool to do kind of more stuff around in this world, like mm -hmm. in the chronicles of Planet Fuck You and the surrounding universe. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I don't know. Like, story wasn't our like key issue number one. We kind of like the story be abrupt, a bit like series, like like Korgoth, for example, mm -hmm. or Prison Pit. Okay, Prison Pit kind of gives you some kind of a backstory, but not a proper one. Um, and Korgov kind of does the same. You just see Korgov of Barbaria, and he's in a pub, and suddenly things happen. <laughs> so uh, kind of like that. Another question, V the Ghost, why does she hate demons so much? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe she doesn't actually hate demons. Maybe she just enjoys, like... Actually, have you ever thought about it? Maybe you are playing the bad guy. <laughs> well, the bad lady in this case. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Maybe she doesn't hate them. Maybe she just likes killing demons, like for well, fun. Well, she does have a shotgun assault rifle. So I mean, you don't get that if you're a friendly person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, getting back to the skills of Tormentor X Punisher, uh, for people watching, how many skills are current in the game, or do you want to say it's a secret for those of you watching? Mm, um, experiment. That's <laughs> all I can say. Try different interactions, like mm -hmm. try bouncing a bullet off a shield, for instance, or shoot through enemy bullets with the shotgun, or stuff like that. Like, also there are things that might not upgrade the shotgun but but you can interact with to do something else mm -hmm. yeah now, and uh, just to um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong there are are there perks for the machine gun side or are the perks only for the shotgun side so this is something that I had in the prototype in the, like the original prototype that I did you could upgrade the machine gun as well but to me it didn't feel that fun at some point. I was like, it kind of made it a bit too. Because I like how, like, not right now in the game, you only upgrade your shotgun. Okay. And I like kind of the. I kind of like the kind of. It's kind of a clear reward system in a sense. And I kind of like that. And mm -hmm. when I had, like, machine gun upgrades, it kind of made the game, like, uh, like lean towards the machine gun more than the shotgun. And I didn't really enjoy that. I like that the somewhat seemingly weaker weapon suddenly becomes the better weapon, but you need our weapon for length still, or like quick interactions. So the machine gun is just a way for you to kind of get away from nasty situations fast, but the shotgun is your main thing, and you have to actually like think about what you're shooting and when. All right. And also, actually, we have a third weapon in the game which is punching. When you're out of bullets, if you're machine gun, you can punch. And try punching stuff. You might be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I guess in terms of... I think we may have talked about this on the last podcast, but just to um, tie it here, how did you come up with the design for the various skills that you wanted to have in Tormentor? Um... Uh, I don't know, just it was pretty much us jamming and we had like we had more upgrades actually in the original like jams that we did. Or like when we tried round like tried around different upgrades, but then we kind of started noticing the ones that actually made kind of sense or they kind of kept the balance in the game or were just simply fun. And then we just kind of decided to keep the upgrades that that, that, that kind of have their own unique gameplay, like like their own specific thing that they do for a gameplay. So, for instance, the fire shots with the shotgun that um, kind of leaves fire trails, which you can use to like trap enemies that are otherwise hard to kill, or like if you want to kind of leave a small trap for 
small amount of time. And when you have like so long that makes your like shotgun longer, like the bullets mm-hmm. fly longer and stuff. Like we kind of made things that kind of eventually makes the shotgun like a more viable option. Mm-hmm. And that's very yeah. interesting. Again, keeping with a lot of the game's vocabulary is kind of hidden under the surface. Like it mm-hmm. took me like when we when I first showed it off on the stream, it wasn't until like about like thirty, forty minutes in that I started to put together what the the upgrade system was going for. And then mm. once you start doing that, it really does add another layer to the game. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's definitely like at first you don't even realize it's like you, how could you know it's a thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like we don't tell about you it. You just at all. see like random words pop up on the screen basically. Yeah, and then you see start seeing them like more often and then you see like oh, it has a name and it's always the same name and there's like a counter under it I did that thing and the counter went up it's like hmm I wonder what happens if I repeat this trick often enough that the counter is full and then it's like your character starts spazzing out and you're like oh wow Wally or something <laughs> and you're like oh what did, did I learn some what was that then you like shoot the shotgun again and you see that it did something and you're like oh are these like upgrades and then you get an hour one and kind of the way how they work is that you'll eventually start accidentally gaining other upgrades so while you have an upgrade because it help, makes it easier to gain other upgrades and kill enemies so you kind of start organically collecting them and seeing different like upgrades pop up and stuff mm-hmm. so yeah huh. now uh, moving from the skill side uh, let's talk a little bit about the bosses, because that's the other major element that changes how the game plays. So, mm-hmm. as we said earlier, about every minute or so, a new boss spawns. And right now, there are, you say there's currently seven different bosses, right? Yeah, I need to... I can, this is kind of embarrassing. I can't even remember how many bosses we have. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and the trick about them, of course, is once you kill a boss, or once they spawn, they do something to the level. They'll add uh, one boss adds like a giant buzzsaw that starts like running around the perimeter. Another one adds walls, stuff like that. I guess what was the approach that you wanted to do with designing the bosses around that manner? Um, so yeah, I really wanted the. I, I, I like um, like a lot of people ask me like why don't I just add more enemy types and stuff? And I was like, what's the point of like. What, what would these different enemies do and how would that affect like the kind of core gameplay and make the game somewhat readable still. So I decided to only have like four basic enemy types. Then I thought, what about if we have bosses and bosses do the special things and as they are kind of more special encounters, we can make them kind of do the special moves that like the additional enemies would do. But this time it would be readable because you see this whole like focus doing it like you have to focus on them like oh it's doing that thing now mm-hmm. and also we only had one arena in, game, in the game and I kind of wanted to keep it as a one screen or one arena game and I decided that what if the bosses do these special moves but at the same time they change the arena each with their own way and at different times they they kind of change it differently so let's take as a easy example Golem, which is this huge boss who throws a stone slab, mm-hmm. like a huge giant stone slab, and when he throws the stone, you can clearly hear him. Uh, you can clearly see him like raise the stone and throwing it, and this stone <laughs> flies onwards, and then it hits like the edge of the arena, which makes the whole foundations shake and like chunks of ceiling drop down, and you realize, oh wait, these ceilings they actually stick to the ground and they are now permanent walls. So he starts building walls while still throwing these stone slabs at you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have the bosses change arena like that. And then there's like another boss called Carrion who jumps up and you can see like this shadow looming around you and suddenly like <laughs> smacks down and <laughs> raises like a whole room up. And we have like bosses change the arena like that. Then we have different kinds of interactions for let's say a boss called Snitch, who is this rat with a, <laughs> who's this tiny rat with a huge bow, and then he shoots his bow, and that arrow goes through 
all the walls. It destroys walls, but at the same time, it leaves a deadly trail of like poisonous fire, which turns enemies into meat walls, and also into acid pools. So we have like enemies who kind of um, use other enemies as their resources, or they can like destroy other bosses' creations. So if you like have a room, you're like, oh, I have this room where I can be kind of all safe and cuddle up and then there's another boss who destroys the room you're like oh no I gotta keep on running <laughs> so yeah we have like kind of those kinds of interactions with the bosses and sometimes the interactions happen when they're alive or sometimes interactions happen when the boss dies mm -hmm. so we have like two stages of like interactions happening mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and, and that as we said it really does go a long way towards making sure each run uh, changes. Like, one of the things about a game like Geometry Wars or Double Daggers is that due to the time system, you're usually seeing the same things each and every run. It's just, ooh, it's just that the longer you play, of course, you see more of it. But it always mm. makes, like, the first two, three minutes the same exact play. But mm. because you have the randomly uh, selected bosses, especially after the first minute, it quickly changes how each run goes, depending upon what order you get them. And of course, mm. what they actually will do during their time alive. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point about like having a few minutes of doing the same thing. I mean, of course, every game will kind of have that. But um, in Tormentor, I wanted to keep the game like really fast, and that mm -hmm. kind of self-remedies it. Like, even half a minute kind of feels like a lot of time, but then again, it's only half a minute. Mm -hmm. And that's all that, like, the whole beginning is kind of, at first it's dedicated to the player learning the game and the mechanics in the game. But when you get better in the game, that beginning becomes precious time to decide your build and try to pull tricks to gain a specific build in your mind. And even if you don't gain that specific build in your mind, you either accidentally start gathering another build or you're like oh no I don't have enough upgrades what's gonna happen and then the boss spawns and then you know chaos ensues mm -hmm. so yeah it's really designed to be like really player like mm -hmm. players actions first <laughs> kind of a game cool. a few questions from chat XP asked how many people actually worked on Tormentor X Punisher okay so it's me doing game design, sound design, and music. Um, then it's, and I did the original prototype programming as well. So when we wanted to add new features and stuff, I might like do like a mock up thing myself first, and then I would say to the team, hey, let's try this thing. Then we had Bo Bliff, who did the actual programming of the game. He worked on amazing games. Like he worked on one of my favorite games ever called Samurai Gun. It's just a beautiful game. And then he worked on Hyper Light Drifter, Zero Space, and so on. And then we had Tuka Stefansson. This was his first. This was his first uh, commercial game. He did the in-game graphics. And then we had John Vermilee, who did the promotional art. And then we had Isa An doing the voice acting. And then I did a gave a sound cameo to my coworker Nilo Takalainen, mm -hmm. who did uh, sounds for the blue enemies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's our team. Like the core team was three people essentially. All right. And I think we may have answered this at the start, but uh, just for the same question, how long was Tormentor X Punisher in development for? Um, like, we started in July 2016, and it was finished, like, last month, pretty much. But now we are, like, patching and stuff. So I guess, like, the commercial version, 10 months, plus patching now. Okay, cool. Yeah. Now, I guess um, another question that I know some people were talking about, or actually before we get to that, uh, talking about the music, I know there are a few fans of the uh, soundtrack for the for Tormentor in chat. I think El Goro enjoyed it when we were playing it. Um, is, nice. there a, 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 is there a OST for the game, or a way to buy the soundtrack separate? Yes. Um... So you can listen to it in Bandcamp or buy it from Bandcamp, and it's also on Steam as a purchasable DLC thingy. And yeah, we have a soundtrack now, and oh man, that was so much fun to do. <laughs> but it also, it was kind of a weird thing, because I started the soundtrack with the prototype version already. 
which was like back in like 2015, like early 2015. And yeah, I started making the soundtrack and I made it for the prototype. And then when we kind of started picking up pace with the commercial version, which was like July 2016, uh, like a few months prior to that, the Doom soundtrack kind of surfaced. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is awesome. And at the same time I realized, oh no. Oh no, my soundtrack is semi-similar. It's not like it, they are pretty different in the end, actually. But like the spirit of them are like the spirit of the soundtracks is the same. Like they are like really in your face, aggressive. Like ah, oh, let's kick demons. And both had demon theme. Both were like ah, uh, six, 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 and pentagrams all around. And and I was like, oh no, people are gonna compare these two together and. Like, I've heard some, like, oh, man, you just took Doom. Like, you ripped off Doom. And I'm like, man, I started this soundtrack, like, two like a year before even knowing of Doom. (laughs) The new one. But, yeah, that was kind of... It was a tough one. Like, when I started to actually properly, like, create the soundtrack, that was kind of in my mind. But then I just decided to be like, ah, sod it. I'll just... I'll just make... I'll just make what I want to make. And... It kind of became more cartoony in a sense, but yeah, it's really really fun to do. Mm-hmm. It also features like guitars and like band instruments and stuff and electronic music. Mm-hmm. And I know you have a music video for the soundtrack too out there <laughs> too, that someone showed me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that just kind of we were just talking with like uh, Rolle, who's the like trailer guy at Raw Fury who's our publisher. Um, we just, you know, we were just talking about like jamming, jamming ideas and we were like, should we do a music video? And we're like, yeah, let's do a music video. <laughs> and I made the music video to be like a tutorial of the game in a sense and like a really cheeky like announcements as advertisement music, like a track. Like, oh, it's only seven ninety nine. Like, who sings about that stuff? <laughs> 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 nice. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. I know we are hitting an hour into the stream, so oh, wow. I have a few, I think, remaining questions for you. For you guys watching, uh, this is probably going to be the first warning if you have any questions for Jonas, because we'll probably wrap things up maybe in like the next, I would say maybe 10 or 15 minutes, depending upon how things go, if that works for you, Jonas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure thing. All right. Uh, so one thing I know that a few people are commenting about on the forums is, of course, uh, the screen shaking. Like, uh, for those of you who haven't played the game, whenever you use a shotgun or just like as you're playing, you know, the screen does have very violent shaking. I know that there was some talk about trying to either tone it down or come up with an alternative. So I was just wondering, for people watching who may be inter- or curious about that, uh, what were your thoughts on that in terms of the heavy screen shaking? Oh, I'm glad I get to talk about this verbally (laughs) perfect um so yeah um indeed it's i knew from the very beginning even when i made the prototype i knew this is gonna be a huge like well not when i made the prototype i didn't think it's gonna be a huge thing but like as soon as we started making the commercial version i knew it's gonna be a huge thing that because screen shake is something that i wanted to make artistically in the game like Mm -hmm. We kind of made a lot of things kind of cater to that, and like the core feeling of the game to cater around that effect. Um, like I was, we were experimenting with cameras a lot. We kind of enjoyed making that kind of happen, and we made like various kind of screen shake things and camera movement things and tricks. And to us, it was like an aesthetic. It's a bit like having overdrive on a guitar, you know? Like it's kind of kind of nauseating and like in your like face and aggressive like aggressive is the perfect word it was like visceral aggressive kind of an effect to kind of disorientate the player but and to give weight to the game like that was kind of all intentional and during development we were like oh man is this like is this too much and we were like kind of doubting it and then I just then we kind of made options. We actually made options to the game where we had like no screen shake, light screen shake, and the normal one, and extreme screen shake. And like it became apparent that extreme was way too much. <laughs> <laughs> and 
the standard was pretty much what it is now. It was actually a bit more back then. And then the light one felt like we were kind of holding back. And I didn't like that feeling. It kind of felt weird. And then no screen shake just did not feel good to me at all. And like with everything in life, I kind of think, is this good to me? What do I feel like? And I was like, no screen shake just felt not good. And I hated that with a previous game I worked on called Nuclear Throne. We had this slider where you could turn off screen shake. Mm -hmm. And to me, I just did not, I mean, the game looks awesome, of course. Like Paul Beer's pixel art is amazing. But to me, having screen shake kind of brought something to the game. It evoked a feeling inside me that I, I was like, oh, this is, this is cool. Like, I, I want this. And, 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 and so no screen shake was definitely not an option. It just felt wrong. And it would be like putting growling on Britney Spears, you know? It just <laughs> wouldn't... <ugh. laughs> and, 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 and. But then we released the game. We decided, okay, we'll just have our like our setting of screen shake. This is what feels good to us. This is mm -hmm. what represents what we want to bring forth. But I I mean I kind of did, but at the same time I didn't think about people who might actually like who might actually experience like mm -hmm. like severe nausea and kind of discomfort and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I was actually scratching my head. I had to take a few walks outside in like clean air and think about what's up and 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 I was thinking like okay we can't have a same scoreboard for people who have screen shake and who don't because mm -hmm. it would be you know who would play with screen shake yeah. anymore it would make the game easier and I didn't want that and I was thinking about like not because to me penalizing people for experiment like experiencing mm -hmm. nausea and stuff feels wrong as well like it's not their fault it's, you know, it's not their fault that they just can't handle mm -hmm. it, you know? Um, and it's a natural thing, like... Mm -hmm. Like, some people get horribly sick in a bus, like, traveling in the backseat of a bus or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's normal. And and I didn't want to punish people for that. Like, we were talking about it in our, like, Discord chat and stuff, and people were like, yeah, maybe, maybe, like, give them a, like, minus points or something. I was like, no, 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 that's penalizing, and I'm... As a design choice, I don't like penalizing people. It's, just, mm -hmm. it's not a honest thing to do. It's not a fair thing to do. So we talked about it, and we started experimenting on a low screen shake shedding, uh, setting. That would be, you know, we still have screen shake. We still present the feel that we want to bring forth, but in a more easier packet. And we were kind of experimenting with that, and I think we are starting to find like a option that should work to a lot of people like we still want to reach out people who like experience nausea mm -hmm. and we want them to try like we don't want them to be of course harmed or anything but we want them to try even briefly like how does the new screen shake setting feel to them so it's toggleable we have like intended like standard screen shake and then we would have the low version and we've been designing it so that you know whichever you choose it's essentially as kind of fair or attempting to be as fair. <laughs> it's it's been a really weird one. Like we've been changing how the camera acts and like how how, how it like actually works and we've been kind of experimenting with ideas and that's gonna be on our next patch, which hopefully should be out really soon as a quick fix. Because we still have a bunch of other things to patch, but mm -hmm. we felt like this is such a huge thing. We want more people to enjoy the game. But of course for some people, even the slightest like shaking of screen or like mm -hmm. things happening you know for some people it's still going to be too much and that kind of sucks sucks because we do want a lot of people to enjoy the game but you know you just sometimes can't do something for everyone like mm -hmm. for instance VR like mm -hmm. VR headsets they do not work for me like I <laughs> literally I cannot use them it feels horrible and 3D movies I, my eyes can't watch 3D movies. Like I always see it blurred, even with the glasses. I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, hmm. Yeah, I know. It's always that challenge between keeping with the aesthetic and trying to make your game as accessible as possible. Like mm -hmm. um, another big example I've heard is are people who get seasick from playing first-person shooters. 
And yeah. like I've never had that happen to me, thankfully. But I know a few friends who cannot play uh, like heavy, intense first-person shooting, or even like just first-person games in general, because like that yeah. bobbing of the motion, it just makes them feel like they're going to get sick. Yeah, and it's one of those things that that's you know what can you do? <laughs> like it, it's yeah, I mean, even if like they would go like out of their way to do like like massive tweaks to the game, it might still not work for them. And you know, it's one of those situations where you are just like, ah, like sorry, maybe this just doesn't work for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it sucks to say because I want more people to enjoy it than less. But then again, I don't want to compromise what we want to make. It's like if we take screenshot shake away, it just doesn't feel right, and it just makes the whole leaderboards things messed up. And then another thing is like, 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 like people have been asking like. Can we tone down the swearing and the vocals and stuff? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> that is a core part of the game. It's like asking Dark Souls people, like, can you please take away the difficulty of the game? <laughs> Which kind of defeats the purpose or like, you know, like Binding of Isaac, like, ah, can we take away the poop, you know? <laughs> it's not the same game then, it's a different game. Like, mm -hmm. like Geometry Wars. You can play Geometry Wars. It's similar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think with that, I got just have a few final questions for you, Jones, and then we'll start to wrap things up. So uh, for those of you watching this live, this is going to be final warning. If you have any questions for Jonas, we'll probably going to wrap it up after this section. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the reception and I guess current plans for Tormentor. So I guess the first part then is how has been the reception for the game? Ah, uh, like I, I, to me, it's already a victory reception was like maybe not sales wise. Sales wise, <laughs> it's really not selling well. But what is well is that people who I adore, like whose game design I simply adore, look up to, follow all of their writings, Twitter, everything they post, have been praising the game, which to me is. This is immensely crazy. Like I've been talking about Spelunky probably like five times this interview already. And Derek Yu, like the creator of Spelunky, he's been posting on Twitter about like the upgrade system in Tormentor and how he likes the upgrade system. And he even made like a meme picture of the upgrade system, which to me is like I I <laughs> like I'm speechless. I'm speechlessly like thankful and excited and just like oh, wow, that's this is crazy to me. And JW from Lambeer, the upper half of Lambeer. Um, I always like, like even like before Nuclear Throne, I just adored his game design. Like super crate box, loop trousers, gun guards. Like so, he's made so many great games that I played to this day. And and he was like posting about all the design elements in Tormentor Expansion. And me, that's like, I, I, it's just again speechless. And like uh, Birch, uh, who wrote for uh, writes for like Borderlands, like story for like writer for Borderlands and stuff like that. He was playing the game on stream one day, and he was like, "Best reload me." I mean, oh sorry, on YouTube, and he was like, "Best reload mechanic in any game." And I was like, "What? That's crazy!" Like these are all of these people whose work I admire, like are praising it. To me, that's like. That's a victory. Like, no one can take that away. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Um, I guess moving on then, for like actual updates, I know uh, you mentioned, of course, doing a quick patch for the screen shaking. I guess, mm -hmm. what do you guys have planned, I guess, for the coming weeks for Tormentor? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's another great question. Um, so indeed, the screen shake thing, we are, we are addressing that. So hopefully that will help a lot of like other people to experience and enjoy the game. And at the same time, we actually did another tweak to help people follow the game. That we kind of made the player more readable, and we've been tweaking so that people don't lose track of the player, of themselves in the game. We've been kind of fixing that a lot and like kind of playing around that. And mm -hmm. and then and, and like the game hasn't even been out for a week yet, <laughs> and we already have like a massive list of like new features. Like I mentioned earlier, we are going to make the game talk to people 
look even more, even more. Like we have, we have a certain things. Like a few, we don't, I don't want to kind of spoil it because it's gonna surprise a lot of people. And <laughs> I'm already so excited. This this is gonna be great. Um, so we notice people doing some certain things at certain times in the game, and we realize the game doesn't address those. So we've been fixing things to address people doing these certain things. <laughs> Um, yeah, so just you know, adding adding small things like that, bug fixing. Luckily, we haven't had that many bugs. Like only a few things, and they are even minor things, like s screenshots not working in Steam. We fixed that already, and cool. stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I can get some of the screenshots for the game then for my look at it. <laughs> yeah, we have like a bunch of other stuff planned. If the game does well enough, or if we get like funding to more stuff, like we have. We have something in mind that I really want to do that might address one question that was asked earlier, but I won't go to that question, so it remains <laughs> mystery. <laughs> <laughs> and I assume uh, more bosses would probably be like on the, um, I guess, the hopeful list at the moment too, right? Oh yeah, totally. Like we would love to do like like a proper DLC. Like we have crazy boss ideas. We've been, you know, we've been just talking and jamming <laughs> ideas. Like that's how the game was born and that's how the game has like been since development we've always been like hey what if this thing happens and it's like oh man I wish we had that in the game but we just you know we have a massive backlist of ideas that we want to do like hopefully the game does well enough that we can bring these things mm -hmm. awesome and yet a game like this like going back to what we were talking about earlier in the cast with something like Monolith for instance like, those kinds of games, they just really beg for more content, especially when you get that, the core gameplay loop solidified. Just mm. more kind of do so much to really add to the game in terms of making each run different. Same mm. thing goes for, like, the buying of Isaac, when they add in the different level variants, the different bosses that can now appear. Like, you're still doing, like, the same run. You're still spending mm. 20 to 30 minutes per run in those games, but mm. it just makes those runs even that much more varied than they were before. Mm, yeah. Yeah, like, with Tormentor, like, pretty much how I enjoy games. Like, I I personally don't enjoy DLCs that much that kind of bring to the core game that much. I like when they kind of take you somewhere else. And that's kind of what I want to try with Tormentor as well. Yeah. Like, kind of giving more different experiences to different people kind of a thing. I, it's kind of... I, kn I know I'm kind of sounding like a bummer here, kind of not telling not telling what we have in mind, but that's kind of the spirit of the game. Mm -hmm. Like, that's kind of another thing. Like, I, in, I adore things like Radiohead and how Radiohead the band and how they, like, hide things and suddenly they just release an album or something. <laughs> I like that. That, to me, there's something... Or, like, in Spelunky, like, you figure out and you find new things. That's there's something to that mysticism that I enjoy. It always makes things seem bigger than they are. <laughs> I would say with that, I think the one copy I have is that I like that the game at least will just tease it so the player even knows that there is a hint that it exists. Like I've played mm. video games where there are elements in the game that the game will literally not tell you about at all, mm. and the only way for you to figure it out is if someone just spells it out for you on a guide or a tutorial page somewhere. Mm. Yeah, I'm kind of like that in specific mm -hmm. like ways. Like sometimes reading something and you're like, "Oh, what? You can do that?" Like the uh, egg pant run in Spelunky, for instance. Yeah. That's like, "Wow, I." What? Like, that's just crazy. <laughs> and we actually, I'm going to go and flat out say this, which I kind of promised myself I wouldn't, but like, I've noticed that reviews and people, because we, we are secretive, we, we do this deliberately and we know it might be kind of elusive to a lot of people, but um, we actually have, like, earlier asked, we have game modes, and we have a game mode in the game that no one has found yet. Mm. Well, for you folks watching, you know what to do once we're done talking. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. I like that. <laughs> oh, hey, I'll go to back. Um, 
Have you tried... Uh, no, I've not tried non-guns yet. I've heard a few things about it. Have you heard of that game, Jonas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I picked it up uh, a few days ago. Cool. All right. We are now at just about over an hour and 15 in, so I am running out of questions. Again, we start talking about animation. We'll be here for like another hour or two. <laughs> so um, I think it's probably time to start to wrap things up. So again, for you folks, if you have any final questions, get them in now. So I guess uh, for you, Jonas, do you mm -hmm. have? Are you currently working on any? I know you mentioned at the start that you're working on a few more uh, game projects, but do you have anything mm -hmm. coming down the pipeline? Um. So yeah, I as I mentioned earlier, I'm a sound designer and voice actor by trade. Uh, Tormentor was kind of this weird one-off game design thing of mine, <laughs> and hopefully I'll do more. Like I I have a bunch of great game ideas in my mind. Well, actually, prototype versions as well, and um. Yeah, I'm working as a sound designer and voice actor. Uh, most of these games I'm working, I can't say yet because they have been unannounced. But I jumped in this game called Planetoid Pioneers as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be directing their audio starting off the day. Cool. <laughs> and uh, let's see, V the Ghost asks, can we get a hint to the secret mode? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you have it, folks. <laughs> No, <laughs> uh, no. I, I, I. If I, if uh, no, no, no. If I say a hint, mm -hmm. people will find it this evening. So yeah, definitely. So, <laughs> so keep your. Uh, this is the only hint, and this is gonna be vague as ever. Okay. Just keep your mind. Or be open-minded. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> and that's good life choice. That's good life. Um, mm -hmm. Like, like that's another hint. Like, be open-minded and think about life in general. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was going to ask if you have any like final thoughts and you like to say, but I think that's a, a pretty that's a good perfect. expression <laughs> to end on. <laughs> perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> All right. So. I think with that, we're going to wrap things up for today. Uh, Jones, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I'm glad that my modem managed to stay on for the length of the podcast as we get this all yeah. done. Wow, yeah, thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me again. That was a pleasure. And yeah, no thank problem. you so much. And thank oh. you for everyone listening. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can do this again in the future, whether it be recorded or live like this. Yeah, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> awesome. All right, so for those of you watching this live right now, we are going to end things here. If you haven't picked it up yet, Tormentor X Punisher is currently available on Steam as well as the soundtrack. Is it available on any other digital stores, Jonas? Yeah, it should be up in like all major like digital stores that sell like other people's games, like Humble or uh, I think Good Old Games and even the Mac App Store, if I'm not mistaken. Cool. So... Uh, for those of you watching this live, we normally do a, um, a weekly review uh, stream, usually like around 9, 10 o'clock. Um, we may have that tonight. It all depends on how my schedule looks and whether my internet's on. So uh, be sure to tune in possibly for that later this evening. So, and of course, for those of you watching this live from Friday to Sunday, we'll be streaming over on YouTube. So, I'll make announcements about that and all that good stuff. For those of you who've been watching this recorded, whether it's on Twitch or YouTube, thank you for tuning in. If anyone is new, be sure to like and subscribe. And check back daily for discussions on game design here and on game wisdom. So, in case I don't do an update video for this week, I should have a podcast up on GameWisdom.com tomorrow. And, or Friday in case that this video doesn't go up but it should go up on YouTube in a few days so uh, Jonas once again thank you so much for coming on and the best of luck with Tormentor thank you so much thank you so much alright so for those of you watching this live we're going to cut the stream here thanks again for watching and we'll hopefully be able to do more developer interviews in the future and if you are a developer watching this and would like to come on for a discussion, feel free to get in touch with me, josh at game-wisdom.com. Send me a tweet, anything like that. But until next time, have a great rest of the day.